dobro večer svima, hvala što ste došli u zbilja zgodnom broju. Sad ćete čuti jedno ovako, ovo je, ja mislim, deveto po redu predavanje razgovora o Evropi, koje mi na ZSM-u vodimo, ja mislim da smo krenuli smo ove godine i sa ciljem poticanja opće rasprave o Evropi, o ulozi Hrvatske unutra Evropske unije i odnose Hrvatske sa svojim susjedima Evropskim. Jer bilo je mišljenja da u hrvatskim medijima i generalno u hrvatskoj javnosti nije dovoljno prisutna ta rasprava na jedan konstruktivan način, pogotovo ne prije samog ulazka u Europsku uniju, zašto su se često javile situacije razno raznih krivih interpretacija uloge Hrvatske, buduće uloge Hrvatske u Europskoj uniji i njenog članstva. Sada ja vam mogu sa ponosom najaviti gospođu Tatjana Jurjevu, koja dolazi sa Moskovskog državnog instituta međunarodnih odnosa koji djeluje pri Ruskom ministarstvu vanjskih poslova. To vam je, recimo, ovako, to bi bio najlakše rečeno ekvivalent ruski JFK School of Government na Harvard sveučilištu. Znači, to je najelitnija ruska institucija uopće obrazovna, visoko obrazovna, to je institucija iz koje između ostalog potječu mnogi predsjednici, političari, diplomati, kao što Rusije, tako i stranih zemalja, od zapadnih nekih viših činovnika do predsjednika bivših sovjetskih republika, a naša draga gošća ovdje je, recimo, generacija zajedno studirala sa ruskim ministrom vanjskih poslova Sergejem Lavovom aktualnim, o čemu će vam možda i reći neku riječ, to znači školski su kolege. Gospodja Jurjeva je ruski ekspert na tako jednoj važnoj instituciji za Evropu, za evropsku sigurnostnu i vanjsku politiku i odnose Rusije sa Evropom. Da ja ne bi oduljio, ovdje sada će vam Branimir Vidmarović, koji je naš cijenjeni kolega ovdje na ZSM-u i doktorirao je na MGMO-u, znači to je skračenica tog sveučilišta, Branimir je doktorirao na temu Rusija i Kina, također priča kineski, poprilično dobro. On će vam sada predstaviti malo više gospođu Jurjevu i u biti njen, recimo, njenu ulogu i njenu karijeru u kratku. Tako da, evo, možemo pozdraviti gospodina Didmarovića i hvala što ste došli. Dobar dan, dame i gospodo, dragi studenti. Poštovani dekane, Marin je ovako lijepo najavio i temu predavanja i samu gospođu Jurjevu. Ono što je meni posebno drago je što je gospođa Jurjeva nekad predavala i meni. Tako da nisam očekivao da ću evo nakon dobrih šest godina moći ugostiti zajedno sa dragim dekanom profesoricu Jurjevu. Što reći o njoj? Neću vam zamarati tehničkim detaljima i popisom njenih dostignuća sa Sivija jer je stvarno pozamašan. Ona je suautorica brojnih knjiga i to takozvanih fundamentalnih knjiga, odnosno odobrenih ministarstva vanjskih poslova i obrazovanja, koji su učbenici, imaju status učbenika, također je autor 28 znanstvenih članaka. Međutim, ono što je za nas najbitnije, je što je profesorica Jurjeva doista vrstan, fundamentalan stručnjak za Europu. A takvih je u Rusiji dosta malo. Dakle, ona će vam predstaviti danas rusko-europsku percepciju, odnosno problem uzajamne percepcije, doista sa mnogih kuteva. Ne samo sa stajališta sigurnostne politike, nego i opće ljudske percepcije. I nadam se da ćete doista uživati u današnjem predavanju i naučiti nešto novo. I tako nećemo duljiti dalje profesorica Tatana Jurjeva. Welcome to you, 
partly in Croatian and partly in Russian. And let me continue in English. So, uh, first of all, thank you very much uh, to the Zagreb School, <coughs> to the Zagreb School of Economic and Management for this invitation. I am really happy to address Croatian students, Croatian colleagues, but at the same time, it is a um, quite a challenge for a political expert like myself to address um, an economic audience. So there wouldn't be any economy in my analysis, nearly any. It will be a pure political analysis of um, basic <coughs> uh, obstacles of the relations between Russia and the European Union. Uh, basic political differences and also basic political similarities. So, so th this is the plan of my presentations. Uh, first of all, some starting points uh, and uh, then I suppose I'll get to first three points. What is Europe? What is a European state, EU and uh, Russia perspectives? And if I have time, I'll speak about some prospects of the uh, relations between the Russian Federation and the European Union. And I have some technical questions. Just uh, ask to leave only one microphone, but maybe it will be quite enough. No, it doesn't work. What if I tried without this? Because, well, you know, any professor, do you hear me? Yeah. Yes. Any professor in any country can speak without microphones. So, uh, and it is easier. If you don't hear me, please uh, let me know that I'll return back to the mic. Uh, maybe, sorry, maybe if you take just this yes, one. Yes, this one is easier. These are the easier solved. First of all, some starting points. Uh, the relations between the European and Russia uh, do not belong to a vacuum. Uh, they belong to a post-bipolar, multi-centric world. So the European and Russia are just, of, just two of many global actors. This is one point. Then my second point about uh, Asian Pacific region as a new center of world economy, maybe not only economy, but also uh, in a foreseeable future of world politics as well. And uh, for example, the United States of America have already reoriented the priorities of their foreign policy to this region, to Asian Pacific region. And some Russian experts believe that maybe Russia will follow the American example. Not because the Americans and Russians uh, do not like, like or love Europe, but simply because they have a pragmatic foreign policy and they just move to a new emerging center. But anyhow, uh, over the last 20 years, and that means over the last uh, 20 bipolar years, there happened a raise of competition in all spheres of world politics and world economy. And uh, in the context of this competition, the West as a whole 
And that means Western civilization based on Christianity, on Roman law, on Greek culture. This big, large West civilization starts to decline. And people in the West, to my mind, and um, I'm expressing my own viewpoint, people in the West are not aware that they are no more of an example to the rest of the world. Because uh, Europeans and the Westerners um, in general, they got used to be a center of the world. European values uh, make the basis of international law. European values, democratic values, uh, have become a what pattern of um, development for quite a lot of countries beyond Europe. But this very Western universalism, the universal significance of European uh, norms and values, now are not being respected as they were some maybe 10 years ago. Why so? Because in different regions, new scales of values evolve. Just like, for example, uh, in uh, Southeast Asia, the ASEAN states have just formulate, formulated what they call Asian values. China has its own values. They are not against the European values. They are not better. They are not worse. They are just different. And there is one more um, <coughs> phenomenon of anti-values that have evolved some maybe 20, maybe 10 years ago. I mean uh, the anti-values of Islamic radicals. Whether they li uh, we like them or not, but it's a fact. It's a part of a very diverse, diverse, post bipolar reality. So the European Union and the Russian Federation have to take into account this um, very uh, important global context. Well, now the European Union and the Russian Federation as global actors, similarity and difference. Well, Russia is a nation state. It has its own foreign policy, absolutely sovereign, and as such, it is predictable. Because we published uh, concepts of our uh, foreign policy, you can just um, go to the Russian foreign minister website, we publish our military doctrines and welcome to the site of the Russian Ministry of um, Defense. We publish our concepts of national security. We have a consensus, a national consensus on uh, aims and priorities of our foreign policy. The situation in the, with the European Union, and you have just entered, uh, the, you have just joined, the European Union is different. Because, uh, well, you all know it better than myself, because you are an EU army, a uh, country, and I'm an outsider. But I'll just uh, draw your attention that the European Union has a two-fold foreign policy. And you never know uh, how will the European Union react on a certain problem of world politics, of world policy. Either the European Union will speak with a single voice. In case if uh, all 28 member states of the European Union agreed on a common position or on a common action. But in most of the times, the European Union cannot achieve this 
consensus on foreign and security policy. And then it splits into 28 national foreign policy. So any third country as a partner of the European Union will never know how to cooperate with the European Union or just like the former uh, Secretary General of the United States, Henry Kissinger, he was joking about uh, the European communities in 1970s, you remember uh, the uh, quotation, I would uh, like to phone to the European communities, but what's the phone number? And he wanted to say that the, Euro uh, that the European community, uh, communities in 1990s, uh, uh, sorry, in 1970s, they did not have any common foreign policy. But now the joke, the same joke, looks different. Foreign ministers of third countries never know what number to dial because there are a lot of numbers in the European Union who are responsible for the European uh, Union foreign and security policy. So, well, this is like it is. Then, uh, European Union and Russia are complement of one another in economic sphere, well, it is an axial one. And it is the real basis of partnership. But the level of political dialogue between the European Union is lower than the level of economic cooperation. And uh, experts in world politics, like myself, um, wonder why. So I'm drawing your attention to one of the reasons of this uh, low level of political cooperation between the European Union. Uh, from the part of the European Union, any joint conference um, collecting Russian and uh, EU experts uh, starts with the expression values gap. It has become a very common expression, values gap. So the European Union, the experts and the political leaders of the European Union are signal that Russia is not a democratic country and they argue that this is the main region of a low level of political Dialogue, because the European Union wouldn't have any political cooperation and even any economic cooperation with a non-democratic country. But maybe some two or three years ago, one of uh, EU high uh, officers uh, started speaking about perception gap. What is a perception gap? It's a lack of understanding or a misunderstanding. To my mind, this is the very reason. It is not a difference in um, political uh, systems, but it is rather a difference of uh, mutual perspe perception. So, first of all, what is Europe? You know, I envy you your conversations on Europe because we don't have anything of the kind in Gimo University. There are uh, what they call dialogues on Europe in the Russian Academy of Sciences, but over the last uh, months, dialogues on Europe in the Russian Academy of Science uh, discussed Islamic radicalism, Caucasus problems and people thought they were um, discussing European problems. So, how many Europe's are there in Europe? Just have a look at this slide. One of the, uh, the first concept uh, comes from the 18th century. It is a Europe from Brest in the French Atlantic coast up to Brest uh, on the uh, border between Poland and Belarus. A 
It's a Catholic and uh, Protestant Europe. Russia is absent and the Great Britain is absent as well. So uh, basically there were two outsiders in Europe, Russia and the Great Britain. Now the second concept was uh, first suggested by the Russian Empire geographically. There were uh, the Russians who wanted to mark a ge geographical border between Europe and Asia in the Ural Mountains. And then in 1960s, the French president, General de Gaulle, said that Europe should be united from the Atlantic Ocean to the Urals. So uh, this kind of a project raised a question, why up to the Urals? Because Urals are dividing were dividing the Soviet Union and they still divide Russia into two parts. Well, uh, the reasons were pragmatic. General de Gaulle wanted to uh, let know the, uh, the Soviet <coughs> government that the European communities in 1960s and later were ready to cooperate with the Soviet Union on um, problems and questions of Western European concern, but not on Russian difficulties in the Far East with Japan, China, and both Koreas. Then came a third Europe from Vancouver to Vladivostok, and this, this happens in 1975 when the um, CSCE means Cooperation uh, for Security and Europe adopted a Helsinki Final Act. So two American countries, the United States and Canada, were baptized as European states since 1975. Then the fourth, the fourth perception, Europe as a synonym of European communities and European Union. We say Europe, but we have in mind only European Union. Russia is, is excluded. You know, when I spoke to my European co colleagues in 1970s, I only knew how to speak in 1970s. Uh, so, uh, and when I told them that I was an expert on European security, they started smiling and saying, oh, you're an expert on the security of the European communities. I say, no, I'm an, an, an expert on security in wider Europe. So we couldn't understand each other. Why did I mark 2003? Because uh, in 2003, just before the uh, massive enlar enlargement of the European Union um, that took place uh, one year later in 2004, the European Commission published uh, a communication uh, about wider Europe new neighborhood. So, people in the European Union were, uh, were aware, since only 2003, that beyond the limits of the European Union member states, there still is some other Europe, other Ukraine, Moldavia, quite a part of your sub-region of uh, Southeast Europe and Russia. So what's the difference between two Europes, the one of the European Union and another? Is it another or are there a lot of others? No answer for the present moment. Then the Euro Atlantic Security Community, uh, initiated by the Organization for Security and Cooperation in Europe in 2010, uh, well, it is a very unclear concept to my mind because in 2008, Russia proposed a treaty on European security. 
uh, it should be a legally binding treaty uh, with all European states, USA and Canada as um, uh, participants. The West wouldn't agree because the West, uh, I don't know why, uh, the West wouldn't explain, but the West uh, prefer not legally binding, but politically binding agreements with Russia. Well, it's uh, up to the West to give some further explanations. So the West wouldn't, uh, wouldn't accept uh, a project of legally binding treaty on European security uh, about uh, collective defense in case of any attack to any um, country of the uh, proposed treaty. And so, to make a compromise, uh, the summit of the Organization of Secur on Security and Cooperation in Europe in 2010 adopts uh, a new political uh, concept, your Atlantic security community. There's no difference between uh, Europe number three and Europe number six. And one more Russian initiative, the last but maybe not the, uh, the least one. Europe from Lisbon to, to Vladivostok, a common economic and human space. So, a lot of uh, perceptions of Europe, a lot of projects, but very little work that has already been done uh, to really unite Europe. So what is a Europe state? You all know it better than myself, so I could probably move to the uh, uh, next slide. Should I speak on uh, the European concept of Europeanization? Yes? Well, uh, there are a lot of publications on this concept in the uh, <laughs> EU member countries, and very little in Russia. But uh, in internal dimension, Europeanization means that uh, the European Union is very keen on sp uh, spreading single norms and values inside the European Union. Because, well, the EU member countries are not similar they are different, but the European Commission would like that they were more alike, more standardized. So, and for um, candidate countries, uh, these values and norms of the European Union uh, were a kind of a golden carrot. It is not my expression. It is an expression of uh, Romano Prodi, the former president of the commission. So, full membership. If you demo uh, democratize yourself as high as the old European Union member states, you will be one more member of the European Union. <laughs> But after the start of the European Neighbourhood Policy in 2003, Europeanization acquires a different uh, external dimension because the European Neighbourhood Policy is addressed to the new neighbours of the European uh, Union and the Union offers its new neighbors, only a silver carrot. One more time, it's not myself, it is one more time, Romano Prodi, the author of the expression. Uh, what does a silver carrot mean? Uh, the European Union <coughs> offers its neighbors all but institutions. That is, that uh, the neighboring countries um, in a time, they will have 
and access to the European internal market, they will enjoy the famous four economic freedoms, freedom of, uh, oh, you know that better than myself, but they will not be allowed to take part in decision-making process. And this is why this, uh, the carrot is <coughs> silver. But what is the price of neighboring countries for this silver carrot? The neighboring countries should adopt European Union values and norms without being members of the European Union. The more they democratize, the more they progress uh, with democratic reforms, uh, the larger access to European internal market they acquire. And the left movements in um, EU countries started a campaign uh, against the European Commission, uh, and the European Commission was accused of um, selling values. Well, this is a left uh, perspective of this kind of a policy. And after the European neighborhood policy, uh, quite a lot of uh, clones of this policy appeared just like Eastern Partnership addressed to uh, post-Soviet states, Ukraine, Moldova, Belarus, uh, Azerbaijan, uh, Gruzia, Georgia, and Armenia. Then, uh, in the same year, the Union for the Mediterranean, and it was a French idea, uh, a great project of the then uh, President of the French Republic, uh, Nicolas Sarkozy, who proposed just please pay attention, who proposed to unite the European Union and Mediterranean states and to make a large, enlarged European Union. Well, Angela Merkel uh, was very sceptic about this kind of project. So, as she does very often, she just corrected her young colleague from France and well, they, she said, well, if you want something to be uh, united in the Mediterranean, let's put it as a union for the Mediterranean, but let it be different unions. So you just let the European, uh, the European Union alone. Please don't touch. And he didn't. Uh, and then quite a series of policies for neighbors, neighbors. For example, in uh, 2007, the European Union issued a special strategy for the post-Soviet um, Central Asia. And I asked my European uh, colleagues, why didn't you include the Central Asia into the European neighborhood policy? Why should you make a special strategy for uh, Kazakhstan, Turkmenistan, Uzbekistan, and Tajikistan. The answer was uh, demonstrated a very legal way of thinking uh, of European bureaucracies because formally they are not our neighbors. They do not have a common border. But in fact, the basis of all these policies is one of the same. So, the European Union is a normative power in a sense that the European Union is a center that spreads its key shared values, its European law beyond its limits. Well, many times ago, many years ago, this kind of a policy could be characterized as an imperial. But the, well, and, well some of Russian ex experts 
looking at this kind of a policy uh, characterize the European Union as a neo-imperial organization. So not only Russia is accused to be an, an, an empire and to have this imperial spirit, but let's go further. Now the European Union perception of Russia. Uh, you know, all you see here belongs to what I would like to call political mythology. Because you probably, maybe the elder generation uh, know this famous slogan, Moscow is the third row and there wouldn't be any fourth. It was a Russian mob philosophy who invented the expression at the beginning of the 15th century. And since then, Russia is characterized uh, as an expansionist power. One more accusation. By uh, Byzantine influence, because Christianity came to Russia from Byzance, and Byzantine tradition in Western Europe meant a tendency to what maybe the word is, is very difficult, Caesarea Papism. Do you understand the word? Okay. So Russia, having got Christian, Orthodox Christian religion from the side of, uh, from Byzantine side, is accused to have a tendency to despotism and authoritarian. Uh, and then Russian imperial tendency. Well, uh, the Russian state was proclaimed empire under the governance of Peter the Great at the beginning of the 18th century. So uh, I have just collected four main accusations and four reasons not to see any sign of a Europe in any Russian state, be it an empire or a communist party uh, or a communist country or a post-communist country. Russia is just not able to become a democratic um, power. But number four, but Russian culture belongs to European culture. Great. We are expansionists, we are despots, we are imperialists, but Europe would like to have our culture in uh, a whole European realm. Well, actually, state of play, there is a, a gap, one more gap, uh, between political declarations and what elites and people think. High political level, uh, that means leaders of European Commission and leaders of uh, all European states, they say that Russia is a part of Europe and that the Russian Federation is its is uh, EU's strategic partner. And it was an idea, the idea of the European Union to make a strategic partnership with Russia since 1999. Nobody knows up to now what it means, but I'll come, to, uh, I'll come back to it later. But when it comes to expert elites and citizens, there is a wide range of perceptions from positives to negatives due to historical stereotypes that you see on your left, then the Cold War legacy, and uh, it can be said in one word, a mutual mistrust. And well, to my mind, uh, the persistence of such a political mythology is also due to low levels of people-to-people -people contacts and to well, to 
a lack of information. What is a European state, uh, a Russian perspective? Well, this is very simple. Russia has never been, and it's not in the present moment, keen on um, identifying itself as a European country. It is, no, it is of no importance to Russia. So, if any Russian uh, is asked, what is a European country, well, okay, you have the uh, Organization for Security and Cooperation in Europe, uh, you have its main, one of its main texts, Paris Charter of 1990s, uh, who adopted human rights, law, rule of law and market economy values similar to the values of the European Union. Uh, but all the texts of the uh, OSC are politically binding. They are just political obligations, but not legally binding. But there is one more body in Europe, and it is elder than the uh, OSC. It is the Council of Europe. Is what it was founded right after the Second World War in 1945. It has, it, it has its own statute of the Council of Europe. And this text enumerates same values, but only two, human rights and the rule of law. Well, because of the uh, scope of, um, comp of competence, of the Council of Europe, it's not an economic body, it is mainly humanitarian and, uh, demo uh, and the body monitoring the process of democratization of um, member states. What is more important to Russia is not uh, a self-determination as a European state, but what we really suffer from is, um, an abs uh, is the absence of social consensus in Russia on what democracy really is. And there, there still is a great debate in Russia on, um, well, the options of democracy in Russia. Just have a look at this slide. So, how many models of European democracy the EU approach is very tough. The Lisbon Treaty, uh, still in force, uh, well, not still, but uh, uh, that entered into force in 19, uh, sorry, in 2009, uh, says that the uh, European Union is following the principle of unity in diversity and that is, it, it is based on shared values. Okay. The Russian approach, the idea of link between universal democratic values and Russian realities and Russian traditions. So this idea of a link between universal and national was uh, first um, proposed by Vladimir Putin when uh, in, in his article, it was his first article published on the 30th of December 1999, the very day when President Yeltsin announced its retirement. But we still don't have a consensus on the contents of this link. What's the balance between universal democratic values and Russian realities and Russian traditions? And what are Russian traditions? There is no consensus even on this point because different uh, political and ideological tendencies in Russia uh, respect different traditions and different values. But in general, the question is as follows. What are the, the limits of diversity? And 
This question is still debated. Now there are the Russian perception of Europe. Well, you know, it has become classic to uh, remember the dispute between Russian Westerners and Russian Slavophiles uh, in the middle of the 19th centuries. The Westerners uh, claim that Russia has to follow uh, European democratic model. Uh, many of Russian Westerners had to immigrate from the Tsarist Russia to uh, democratic France, for example, like, uh, just like one of the most famous Russian writers, Alexander Herzen, Gerzen in Russia. And when Gerzen spent quite a lot of years in France, he became what uh, they now uh, call disappointed Westerner. Disappointed because uh, he didn't like the formal character of French democracy, but people uh, were told not to make crimes because the law forbids. Gerzen, as any Russian Orthodox, would prefer that people didn't make crimes because of moral obstacles and because of ethnic scale of uh, values. Well then, uh, main, uh, their main opponents were the Slavophiles uh, that would like Russia to follow its own route. And road, sorry. And this is a very popular idea in Russia up to nowadays. Russia should follow its own road. And people are quite happy about knowing that we in Russia are following our own road. But people do not uh, interest where does this road come for, comes from, and where does it lead? People are quite happy to feel it, their particularness. We are not alike. We are not like Europeans. We are, we are not like Asians. We are just like Russians. It's not a nationalism. It comes, uh, basically it comes from the uh, Russian peasant uh, commune of um, well, 12th, 13th, and 14th centuries, a sense of collective responsibility, a spirit of collectiveness. You will never hear any Russian to say, my country, my president. Any Russian will say, our country, our president. And people from the countryside, well, maybe not now, but some 50 years ago, uh, when they came to towns, if a single person came somewhere and this person was, act, was asked where he was from, uh, from, he would answer, we are from Pskov. Regardless of the fact that he was a local. So, you know, this sense of collective we and uh, a sense of um, particularness. Uh, and then in 1920s, uh, the Westerners and the Slavophiles were uh, criticized by um, Eurasianists. Classic Eurasianists has, uh, have nothing in common uh, with uh, a grouping of similar <coughs> uh, title that you see in the uh, right part of the slide. So th they were young people, young aristocrats, who immigrated uh, from the October Revolution of 1917 and who tried to understand where does this 
particular Russian road come from and where it leads. And they uh, argued that Russia belonged neither to the West nor to the East, and they formulated this uh, concept of uh, a special civilization, a Russian civilization. Uh, but when it came to real politics, they couldn't uh, formulate any realistic political project that could be opposed to communists, to Bolsheviks, to Westerners, and to Slavophiles. So it is just the brain training uh, concept. Then the actual state of play. We also have Westerners in Russia now, and they say that Europe is the only partner for Russia. Russia should turn, uh, should, uh, should turn its back to Asia, and Russia should cooperate with Europe because it is from Europe that Russia can have uh, um, modern technologies, innovations, and uh, um, goods. Then pragmatics. So the Westerners, are, they are also called Russian liberals. They are minor now. Liberals, uh, liberalism is not popular in Russia because it was absolutely compromised in 1990s when uh, the fall of living standards was called democracy. People preferred prosperity and not democracy. So the Young liberal democrats, just like Gaidar, Chubais, well, they, they've made a bad job. They compromised uh, the whole idea of democracy uh, in the opinion. But then the pragmatics, or as uh, they are now uh, often called, well, I've written a Russian word in uh, Latin, Word государственники, and I suppose that you can understand what that is. Well, uh, people like Putin, like Medvedev, like the leading Russian party, um, United Russia, uh, they are pragmatics because they would like to raise the they would like to raise the living standards in Russia. They would like to raise Russian influence in world uh, politics. And they would like to cooperate with any third country on equal footing, regardless of ideological differences. And this is why they are called uh, not only государственники, but also pragmatics. And then um, Eurasianists, well, they, never, they have nothing in common with classical uh, Eurasianists um, of 1920s. It is a very diverse uh, tendency the contemporary Eurasianists, but they all agree on one and the same assumption. Europe is not a partner. Well then, if Europe is not a partner, who is the partner? Maybe Africa. Maybe Asia. But, you know, uh, I don't like these people, and you, you can feel it uh, from my reaction, because they propose a negative policy. They say that Europe is not a partner and stop there. And what if they came to power? If Europe is not a country, a uh, partner, so who will be the partner? They just don't think about that. You know, in a way, it is just like uh, the concept of a particular Russian road. 
people are happy to accuse Europe and they stop there. Um, and then prospects of uh, the relations between the European Union and the Russian Federation. Uh, I suppose that uh, at the political level, the main obstacle uh, to relations between the Russian Federation and Europe is the absence of a new partnership and um, cooperation agreement. The previous one, one the first one, was uh, signed in 1994. It expired in 2007, and then a problem called um, the problem of two, uh, 2007 appeared in the relations between Russia and the European Union. Russia uh, initiated talks on a new uh, document. Well, the talks are not completed. The talks uh, started only in uh, 2008 because first they Poland uh, vetoed the talks because of economic um, disagreements with the Russian Federation. Then uh, Lithuania also vetoed the talks. Then the talks started in June 2008, and then the Caucasus crisis of August 2008 stopped the talks once more. But at the present moment, the talks are going on, and now the partners are discussing not the uh, partnership and uh, cooperation agreement, but the strategic partnership agreement. And this is a development of the EU idea of 1999 about strategic partnership of the European Union and Russia. Well, you know, I was very keen on finding a definition of strategic partnership. What a, because policymakers are speaking about strategic partnership every day. Uh, expert elites are writing tons of articles about strategic partnership of the Russian Federation and the European Union, but what is it? I found only one, not definition, but um, well, something. It was the former de Russian deputy foreign minister Alexander Grushko, who is now the Russian uh, representative, representative uh, in NATO, and well, in one of his interviews of 2008, Alexander Grushko said that nobody knows what strategic partnership means for the present moment, and it should be a new uh, bilateral document between Russia and the European Union that could make the problem the problem clear. So we are just going on speaking about strategic partnership. Uh, the European Union would like to stop at the level of political dialogue, just like the French. They like to say, if you want to discuss anything, I am in your uh, disposition. Je suis à votre disposition. Uh, I'm at your disposal. Excuse me. Uh, well, French is my first language, foreign language. So, um, but the Russian Federation is in favor of a result-oriented cooperation. Dialogue is very good. And uh, any serious global actor should uh, refuse any possibility of a dialogue, but it's not enough. Because we have to face common global challenges. We have to formulate common positions and we have to undertake common actions. But the European Union would like to stop at the level of dialogue. 
This is something about uh, the strategic partnerships. So just, well, let's wait. We also have uh, the so-called four common spaces since 2003, and um, we have four political frameworks, four political texts, texts uh, called four roadmaps uh, on four common spaces. What is the idea? The idea uh, was formulated in 2003, and the Four roadmaps were adopted in 2005. Uh, the European Union and Russia decided to make four common spaces. Common economic space, common space on um, external security, common space on uh, in internal security, and common space on cultural and uh, technical uh, cooperation and assistance. And if you look at the date, 2003, it was the very year when the European Union started its uh, European neighborhood policy. Russia was also included into the European neighborhood policy, but Russia wouldn't agree. We are following our own road. And the volume of um, relations between the Russian Federation and the European Union, even in 2003, uh, in the sphere of economy, was incomparably larger than the volume of cooperation uh, between the European Union and any other neighbor state. So, a new, uh, a particular political framework was agreed, and since then, over the last 10 years, it's an object of a tough criticism from the elites, from the expert elites, both in the European Union and in Russia. What's wrong? Well, a format of a roadmap means just a set of political goals. Well, for example, in the sphere uh, of my interest, external security, the European Union and Russia would like to uh, make sure that uh, the international peace be preserved, that the international law were respected, that the conflicts were regulated, and so on, and so forth. No dates, no details, just the framework. So what is it all for? This is the uh, <clears throat> attitude and the approach of most of the uh, experts uh, both in the European Union and in Russia. And there is only one happy exception. It is the fourth space on culture and um, technical uh, cooperation. Uh, and this is uh, the space where the progress is really achieved. Maybe this is... This is why I am here now, because it is a framework of people-to-people context. Uh, did I expire my time? Uh, well, we still have about five or four minutes. Well, okay, four no, minutes more. Okay. And then, uh, what are the prospects? A uh, partnership for, for moderna, modernization uh, was uh, signed in 2010. But there are different approaches uh, in the European Union and in Russia to the contents of this partnership. Russia would like to have a detailed technical and economic common projects in pharmacy, for example, in, in uh, the sphere of innovation. So Russia follows its own pragmatic course. The European Union starts with the problem of further democratization of Russia.
partnership. So they say that a uh, partnership for modernization means that the European Union will assist Russia to um, progress uh, with um, democratic reforms. What are the Russian uh, options? Free trade zone. And President Putin has spoken about this, the possibility of a free trade zone quite recently. So it is something that is in work. Common economic space. The idea was um, offered by Romano Prodi in 2001. But after the uh, story about the Ukraine's um, desire to sign the, uh, the agreement on association with the European Union quite recently, the problem of common economic space has acquired a different um, sense because is it possible to be a member of several common economic spaces? For example, is it possible for a country like Ukraine or Moldavia, one more candidate to sign the uh, um, association agreement, is it possible for these countries to be associated with the European Union and to uh, join the customs union of Russia, Belarus, and Kazakhstan? Well, you're economists, I'm not. So the, the question is to you. And uh, one more, two more Russian ideas, common and energy space. And this is uh, a kind of a Russian answer to European war, to the worries of the European Union about the so-called Russian energy imperialism. Well, then the electric energy. Russia is one of uh, electric energy makers. So this is why Russia offers a complex of energy and electric energy from Lisbon to Vladivostok. So that just uh, neither side would be worried, neither the European Union nor Russia. And the last but not least, a common human space from Lisbon to and here we come to a problem of a visa-free regime. Russia is highly in favor, the European Union is highly against, and since your country has just uh, joined the European Union, so all the citizens of the Russian Federation uh, must uh, ask for a visa, and uh, I have uh, an experience of asking visa to a Croatian consulate in a service. I'm happy, <coughs> frankly speaking, I'm very happy about the attitude of the Croatian consulate service in my case, because not all the papers were presented, but I wasn't sent back and the problem was solved in my particular case uh, with the aid of what we in Russia and maybe you in Croatia also call uh, a work of a human factor. So uh, thank you for your kind uh, attention and uh, questions. Now to have a very short discussion uh, to give you an opportunity to ask questions, and, uh, but first we'll give it to Branimir because he's uh, um, he's going to open the discussion and then we can talk a little bit with Professor. Okay, Branimir.
All right. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Yureva. Uh, we'll, op we'll open this discussion, and uh, my first question is on behalf of our dear uh, Mr. Slavan Letica, who couldn't be here with us. And uh, from his uh, mouth, it sounded much more intricate and elaborate, and I'm going to be much more simplistic. So basically, if Russia was to enter Croatian market via acquisition of any big companies, uh, would Croatia be a subject of criticism by EU if Russia was to play a really large role economically in Croatia? Well, I suppose that the question should be addressed to the European Union whether it will criticize Croatia or not. Uh, but as far as the... Well, one more time. Please excuse me. I'm not an economist. So I'm not following... Uh, in details, the situation in uh, uh, bilateral trade of Russia and um, member countries of the European Union. But in principle, Russia gave up a false division of Southeast Europe into two parts, Orthodox Balkan states under the auspices of Russia, historically, and Catholic uh, Balkan states under the auspices of the West. It is not no more relevant because the Russian uh, Federation uh, follows a pragmatic economic course. And any third country has a lot of chances to cooperate with Russia on equal footing, be it then Orthodox, Catholic, Muslim, or a country of other religion. So it is a purely political answer, something like academic blah, blah, blah. Thank you. Uh, Yes, I have one question for you. Uh, I'm sure you have noticed the cross on the wall behind you. And uh, my question is related with uh, values. You talked about uh, Europe values and uh, Russian values or East values. And recently uh, President Putin said that one of the reasons of decline of Western civilization is uh, its rejection of Christian values. What do you think about that? Sorry, I didn't catch your question. Putin said that the... One of the reasons of decline of Western civilization is uh, its uh, rejection of Christian values. What do you think about that? Well, uh, you know, before I came here, I had three uh, talks with... Um, Croatian journalists, and they ask me the same question. Uh, and uh, I believe that uh, I would agree with our president. Because, you know, uh, as, a, as an individual, I believe that um, even if a person living in that or that country is an atheist, that person still follows the uh, prevailing moral code of religion. And when people in West Europe, uh, less in the United States, <clears throat> uh, make uh, of the rights of minorities something dominating, and when uh, some European countries uh, allow uh, homosexual marriages, you know, it's a challenge and even, even a threat to moral code of the nations. You have seen how many French opposed the adoption of the law uh, allowing uh, homosexual <clears throat> families to adopt children. So, you know, 
it, it, it is really a problem. On the one hand, universal democratic uh, values uh, and also um, regular norms of the European Union as a very great achievement of the West. But on the other hand, a lot of people, uh, well, among Russian intellectuals, say that the West reminds them of the last years of Roman Empire. The fall of moral norms. And when people say that I uh, speak about the West, they speak about Russia as well. So it is our uh, common challenge. And this is why the Russian Federation, by the way, uh, some, let's say, six years ago, the Russian Federation proposed a triangular, triangular, very difficult word, triugolny. Uh, is it more clear? Uh, so let it be triangular cooperation in world politics between the United States, the European Union, as Russia, and Russia as leading actors of the West. It's nice to see the cross and fall because it says, it says something about the values of this institution but now about uh, diplomatic relations. Uh, a few days ago in the Netherlands uh, the Russian diplomat was uh, arrested and uh, do you think is this arrestment the breach of Vienna Convention on Diplomatic Relations? Yes, I don't think I know. Because we in GIMO Institute, I'm a graduate from GIMO Institute, so I had to pass a special examination on diplomatic conventions. So it's a violation, it's a formal violation. But if Russia did this, it would be, it would be undemocratic and it would be called uh, despots or uh, well, you know, it's an outstanding... Because, uh, sorry, because uh, the West has uh, double standards, one of their own and one for the others. That's the main problem. Well, uh, let's don't accuse the whole West because of Dutch policemen. It's a separate story and the Russian mass media and especially Russian television gave uh, all the explications of uh, what the Dutch policemen did. It is just the top of a very um, complicated competitions between different oil companies. So the whole attack of the Greenpeace was sponsored and organized, as they say in the Russian mass media, I don't know. Uh, so the whole attack at the Russian oil platform uh, would have been organized and sponsored by uh, concurrence of the owners of the platform. This is one of the explanations. But, uh, well, you know, we in Russia have a very, very rough expression. In English it sounds uh, very politely to beat one's face. Instead of face, people in Russia employ a rather more rough world. It's not a method of competing. It's curious that you don't see the possibility of uh, a partnership with the other countries. In the first place, it's China. It's expanding and it will ex expand for decades. And for Russia, it is, uh, I think, it must be one of the first partners. Uh, secondly, uh, South 
uh, Asia is, is also a problem for Russia. It is very popular in Turkey, very popular uh, yeah, and mentioned very, very, very popular city. So you have uh, big possibilities, but big dangers for your country. It's my opinion. Thank you, and you are absolutely right, because the Russians have to balance between different uh, partners in the East and in the West as well. So, uh, Russia has uh, already constructed new pipelines going into the Chinese and Japanese direction. But I would just uh, repeat that the markets, oil markets, in eastern region are not as large as they are in Europe. But in, in China it will be, they have no oil. They have only coal, but not oil for their energy needs. Well, uh, we have a, we have doctor on my right, who is a specialist on Chinese. Uh, particularities, so what would you say about the Chinese uh, oil policy? Okay, this is uh, sorry, an unexpected turn of event, but uh, basically China will, will strive not to be dependent on one source of oil. So one cannot expect in the future that Russia will become <coughs> the major exporter of oil or gas to China because it will hinder Chinese national interests. As well as, you've seen India buying different, different uh, armament. The same thing here will happen in China. So they, will, they are uh, signing contracts, they're looking for the gas, the shell gas and shell oil from Australia. They're seeking to buy from different sources. So in, I believe in our case, uh, EU is, is really the Russian market, and China is, you know, only partial. Um, I have one last question. I mean, maybe last, unless someone has from the audience. Ah, okay, go ahead first. Uh, um, first, uh, about Christian value, uh, I would like uh, maybe to discard the example of France because. Uh, it, it was the way it, was, it has been mediatized first and um, in a way most of the media in France was talking about the fall of Rome but not for Europe, maybe for the religion so this is first second, uh, maybe more about theory um, uh, at only one or two points you talk about position, strategic position, but maybe the analysis of relations between Russia and European Union would be different if we, want, if we talk about strategic position, which was in the media in all the year, about, I don't know, subjects like Syria or, I don't know. So, uh, what uh, insight could give uh, the other position, uh, the other theory? Uh, not ide idealist, but realist to, uh, to uh, your subject. Thanks. But, so, sorry, do you have a specific question or just... About uh, what uh, could give uh, a realistic approach about the strategic position of U European Union and Russia to uh, your subject. Thanks. Thank you very much for the question, for your question, because being uh, an associate professor of the Department of World Political Processes, I am very keen on theories of world politics. And there is a great debate in uh, the Faculty of Political Sciences in Mugimo about what is liberalism today and what is realism today. And uh, our preliminary uh, conclusion, our preliminary conclusion sounds very paradoxically. We have 
agreed that if we need theoretical instruments to uh, analyze contemporary world politics, we should make a synthesis of neorealist and neoliberal paradigm. But most of all, uh, quite a lot of uh, professors in the um, faculty of political sciences in Gimo are very fond of constructivism paradigm, just like myself, because the whole conception of today's presentation is underpinned by uh, constructivism paradigm, because key words of constructivism, mutual perception and politics is what people make of it. So, uh, for example, for the Bush administration, and for the Obama administration, national interest consists in spreading American diplomatic values beyond the American borders. Here we have a formulation, a synthesis of uh, realist and liberal approaches. And it, it, it's a reality. It was, it's not myself who invents uh, the formulation. This is what Bush administration really did. We have another question for the gentleman over there. Thank you. Uh, dear Ms. Yuriva, thank you very much for your lecture. Uh, I'm amazed by your facts and about your, your, about your opinions. And I will say it in a Latin language, summa cum laude, for your lecture. First of all, Second, I'm a professor of history and a former member of Croatian parliament, the first democratic parliament in 1990s. So, my question is for you. I think that as a politician, former politician and now professor of history, I think the, best, the, the main point between Russia and Europe is and always was moral values. How we interpret moral values of Christianity, especially between Western Christianity and Orthodox Christianity. In my opinion, when Charlemagne, Charles the Great, founded Europe, he founded it as a Christian civilization, not only Western and Orthodox, but United Christian civilization. Unfortunately, in the 20th century, it was, after the French Revolution, systematically destroyed. So, we now have the great conflict between Christianity uh, in Euro-Asia. And I congratulate your President, Vladimir Putin, who excellently understands that problem. But, unfortunately, European politicians, especially in United, so-called United Europe, European Union, uh, are blind on that problem, or against Christianity, I will say openly. So, my question for you is, is it possible that we, in the near future, I think, or maybe distant future, once again have United Christian Ecumena, you know the word from Greek. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for your question, but uh, I'm afraid that it is a question without answer about one uh, about the restoration of a single Christian ecumen, if you understand it, uh, as a uh, reunification of Christian um, churches. Well, maybe the churches are. I mean, uh, the Pope of Rome, uh, the Russian Patriarch, they are ready for dialogue. But it's a separate question. But I think that uh, people in Europe are quite able to restore a common Christian moral unity. 
be, uh, be these people religious or atheists. I've said that the, that the moral code is one and the same for both. And uh, what is really difficult to put together is the difference between Catholic and especially uh, Protestant ethics and uh, Orthodox, because the Orthodoxes, why is this concept about the third rule? Because the Orthodoxes uh, stress the spiritual, the spirit, whereas the Catholics and especially Protestants, they stress rational. So it's a old problem and the problem is still open-ended about the correlation between uh, rational and spiritual. So, but anyhow, I suppose that uh, the audience would agree that this kind of dialogues, like today, they are very useful. They are more useful than uh, maybe um, classic conferences of uh, expert elites, because they put people together face to face. Uh, I'll ask maybe, uh, maybe the last question tonight uh, to, to get back a little bit to politics. Um, so, from my experience having lived in Russia and studied a little bit at um, Guimont, uh, and on the other side having lived in France uh, and did all of my studies there basically, um, these differences that you were talking about uh, in perception especially between the Europe uh, and between Russia are indeed they exist and um, when you're in Europe especially when you're in France uh, there is a, there is a feeling that the world is turning around uh, Europe and, uh, and and the US let's say you know around the West when you come to Russia you have a feeling that you know you start looking at the map where is Europe you know it, it, it's completely another world uh, said you know with, with Russia being the center of, of it uh, um, and now the real question is, these differences that exist and that are emphasized, sometimes I get a feeling that they are emphasized on purpose just because they're actually used as political weapons. So every time uh, Europe, Europeans or Westerners find it convenient, they, you know, accuse maybe Russia of human rights violations. It goes, uh, it comes right back, right back at them by uh, Russians accusing Europeans of uh, moral decay and similar things. So, to me, as an independent observer, sometimes even it even seems as if uh, it's a game uh, of real politics, real politic uh, that's played on purpose, and uh, and that it's not even going to end because it it suits both parties. You know, it's not like they're really looking to stop with uh, with these uh, prejudices and with these false perceptions. It sometimes actually suits the purpose. So, what is your comment on that? Well, uh, you know, I remember some, maybe 15 or, well, yes, about 15 years ago, when in, in Gimo, yes, this was in 1993. It was an anniversary of a bilateral treaty between the Federal Republic of Germany, Germany and France. But amazingly, it was celebrated in Gimo. You never know why. And there was a professor, he was born in Germany. In Germany. He uh, studied up to his uh, higher education in Germany. So we, he was educated as a German, but then he uh, moved to Paris and he became a professor of Sciences Po, uh, the uh, Paris Institute of Political Sciences. And he made the brilliant comparative analysis between uh, France and Germany. And he said that uh, 
his daughter suffered from French formalism. They accused the French, he accused the French to be very, to be very formally thinking a uh, nation. The French really would like to put everything on uh, its own shelf. Uh, for example, in the Institute of Political Sciences in, uh, of Paris, I've been there, they have a, what they call, Seminaire de méthode, a metho methodical seminar, and the students are not asked, but they are imposed to write um, texts according to a one and the same uh, pen. Uh, I can tell something about it. You know what it is. Yeah, but it's a bit... Well, uh, people from Sorbonne are mocking about this um, particular uh, particularity of the... And that German, being a French professor, he said that the Germans were much more spiritual than the French. I'm just quoting. So, you know, when I heard your questions, I heard your comments, and I'm returning to my old idea that after the split of the Soviet Union, Russia has already became, become a normal Western state. Because the West is not united. It is united in diversity. And we all discuss our diversities. So there is nothing special about uh, this or that discussion or the disagreement between the European Union and NATO. Uh, you shouldn't cry pazor or attention. Pozor. Pozor, sorry. Pozor in Russian means something different. Uh, but it is normal. It's a normal uh, state of play between normal democratic states. Ima li još pitanja? Ako nema pitanja, onda uh, dozvolite mi da uh, završim uh, naše vrlo, vrlo zanimljive razgovore u Europi. Hvala gospođi Jurjevoj, ovo je stvarno bila uh, jedna diskusija, jedan razgovor koji je dostojan razine razgovora o Europi. Hvala puno našem partnerskom uh, dragom fakultetu MGMO. Uh, surađujemo i surađivat ćemo još bolje u budućnosti. Vjerujte mi, vrlo smo dobar partner. Drago nam je što imamo tako dobar fakultet na ruskoj strani, a vjerujte mi da je i MGMO vrlo važno imati takav fakultet kao što smo mi za Šem, koji eto još jednom ću ponoviti jer to je doista ponosno, ono što se treba još jednom reći, jedina ACSB akreditirana škola u Hrvatskoj. Tako da doista naša suradnja je suradnja dviju vrhunskih škola i potrudit ćemo se da i u buduće to tako bude i da u buduće ruski studenti mogu za naše hrvatske profesore reći ja sam kod njega studirao. Dame i gospodo, zahvaljujem. Zadnji detalj, nevezano od razgovora je vama studentima ZSM-a koji ste tu, javno vam to.